What's up fellas? This video is for Juan. We're doing a dual electrode test here on this transformer. And we're gonna see if we can achieve resonance with a tube this large. We're basically doubling our surface area. So I'm not sure how well this is gonna go, if it's gonna work at all. I believe that we don't have a high enough frequency to achieve resonance with a surface area this large, but we're gonna try it anyway. Got our oxygen concentrator pumping oxygen through the ozone electrodes. We're just going to keep it at two liters per minute here um, at 95% pure oxygen. From what I've read, there's no sense in cranking nine liters per minute at 35% oxygen through this thing, other than for cooling effect. That would help cool it off, but we're not really interested in that right now. Okay, Juan, I want to show you something right off the bat here. Now, you'll notice as I turn the knob up, the power continues to go up. And it doesn't stop. So what that means is we need a higher frequency. However, we already have the dip switch set to the highest possible. This is the flow rate I'm using on the cooling. So I've got a substantial amount of water flowing through this thing. I might even turn this down a little bit. So that's pretty much as high as we're gonna be able to get it at this frequency. This is still a substantial amount of power though. So we're running at about four amps per cell almost. And the last test I did indicated that four to five amps was the maximum power setting to ozone production ratio. Meaning if you went any higher in power, the excess heating that took place in the electrode would decompose any further ozone production that may have been gained from that process. So temperature is a huge factor. You could make the most awesome ozone electrode in the world, but if the gap and the spark is so violent that it gets hot. I believe anytime you get over 100 degrees, you're really starting to, to lose half-life. Um, it's within seconds when you're in the 250 degree range, I believe. Okay, Juan, here's the oxygen concentrator. We're running at two liters per minute at 95% oxygen. But we're gonna do a quick experiment and we're gonna crank up the oxygen to nine liters per minute at 35% oxygen. And what that does is that actually gives us three liters per minute of oxygen and six liters per minute of nitrogen. So the problem with that is, is that nitrogen compounds tend to react with the ozone electrode just the same way oxygen does, or nitrogen gas does, I mean. Another thing that's happening here is you see the large bubbles? They are now splashing all over my piece of test copper, which may have botched the copper test. Uh, we don't want that to be wet because the liquid actually shields the metal from exposure to the gas. So I may have just botched that uh, copper test here. We do get some green copper later, but I feel we don't get as much darkness because I just made it wet. So we're gonna have to take that into consideration when we look at the copper test. Nonetheless, um, Another weird thing happens here. The power consumption starts to drop. So it leads me to wonder. So without an ozone meter, I'm pretty much flying blind here, but I'm doing what I can. Hey, it seems to have dropped the current. Yeah, check that out. Let me turn the watts back. I'm gonna turn this dial back down to two. Okay, I do know that the oxygen reacts more readily than the nitrogen does. So that would explain why we're, we're drawing higher current at a pure, uh, a higher 
oxygen concentration. So here we are back at this. I'm kind of, I'm led to believe I need to just keep it at two liters per minute. It's only been about a minute and a half and we've already climbed all the way back up to almost eight amps. We're back to 1200 watts. So I'm glad I did that. Um, this does kind of corroborate the notion that I discussed before, indicating that the higher oxygen concentrations are far more beneficial than a higher flow rate of a lesser gas. Another thing I wanted to point out to avoid current losses is that the discharge water of the outer jacket and inner jacket should be teed together as far away as possible. Let me show you why. Watch what happens when this touches. You see that? Whoa. That was a very large spark there. Not cool. And I hope that's not attributing to some of the current draw that we're seeing, but it very well could be. This is high enough voltage that we may be getting like some uh, lynching graph activity going on inside the water there. Now, when that's far away, it won't shock you. Like this is not shocking me. However, if you touch any of those constituents up closer to the cell, there's no available resistance and you get a little tickle there. But uh, I'm curious, I doubt we're losing very much power this way. But nonetheless, you can experience losses from stuff like that. Okay, this is the two and a half hour mark. I must mention that when I added the solution, man, I'm getting kicked in the face with ozone from here. Whew. I've got fans blowing and everything. It's still pretty potent. Um, I did accidentally add a little bit more food coloring than I was supposed to. I added an additional cc of food coloring in the, into the pipette. I did dump it back out, but that still means my mixture was a little bit more concentrated than the previous mixtures. Um, nonetheless, we have witnessed a drastic change here, even with a very inefficient exposure to ozone. The um, we don't have like uh, an air stone. We're not stirring or nothing. We're just letting it bubble right through it. So the fluid isn't coming in contact with the ozone in a very effective way at all. So the ozone could actually be a lot more powerful than it appears to be. I really hope it is, but without a meter, I'll never be able to know that. Um, we will be finding out how much ozone these things put off coming up here soon as you hook them up to the ozone meter that you have and uh, I want to let this run another half hour I would like to see the copper though oh man check that out guys we got green copper this time look at that I gotta zoom this in that is green copper fellas Okay, in the last test that we did, at no point did we ever produce green copper. You can see here, this is from the previous test when I ran just one cell at 5 amps. Okay, and now I'm um, running two cells at the 8 amps. We're actually running each one at about 5. We are um, contaminating this copper so bad that it's actually turning it green. That is a great sign. That means the ozone concentration is extremely high. That's what we want to see. That's why I put that copper on there as a secondary litmus test, if you will. I did forget to show that we are at 1,235 watts or so here. 8.18 amps. Okay, so we are three hours into the test. We have cleared up about as much as this stuff clears up. When you put this much food coloring in the water, it never does go 100% clear. 1,235 watts still. 0.61 power factor. The input voltage is 238 volts.
Let's check this copper out. Yeah, we got some water on our green stuff there. That kind of messed us. Okay, now remember when I said there's a lot of variables to testing like this? Because I let all that water splash all over this copper, it actually protected a large majority of it. It, it would have been a lot more damaged than this had that not gotten wet. It also appears that the moisture from that splashing has kind of um, inhibited the green copper oxidation reaction we were seeing because the green stuff that we saw in the last inspection has been wetted. It's still there, and you can tell that it's green, but the camera isn't picking up on it too good. So getting water all over this kind of botched the copper test. But nonetheless, there are still some green specks here I'm going to try and point out, and it did blacken the stuff substantially. Still some green. Yeah, the spot that was green, I accidentally got a bubble splashed on it. Now you can't really see it anymore. That's the before. A little bit of green copper right there. I think essentially what's happened here is we have reached the limitations of two liters per minute of oxygen input. I looked into buying an oxygen tank. It's going to run us about 400 bucks. So I don't know what we want to do with that. But I think that's the reason why the test, the jar test, isn't doing any real difference. Because no matter what we do, we're still only doing about two liters. So we, we could have been maxed out on the last couple texts as far as um, what is theoretically possible. And I just don't know that because I don't have more oxygen available. But that's the big key factor right here. I believe we have far too small of an oxygen input. Literature that I have looked through indicates that using any nitrogen contamination whatsoever is definitely a bad idea because of the other chemical reactions that can take place. Now this does a couple of things. This um, destroys equipment downstream and it just robs electrical power from the process that's just wasteful. So we don't want any nitric acid production going on and none of that stuff. So we don't want to use any nitrogen if possible. Um, there is also the option of an electrolysis oxygen generator, but that's a whole other deal. We could get pure oxygen that way, though. I wonder if Delva sells anything that puts out about 10 liters per minute of oxygen. So at this point, Juan, I almost think we ought to keep these electrodes here while the um, other transformers here so I can try the higher frequencies. But that's up to you. The same thing could happen on your end, and I can just show you how to tune these things up. So let me know what you think. I definitely need more oxygen to get any more out of these things, I think.